Um, dear colleagues, I would like to start with thanking the organizers for um, inviting me <clears throat> to speak at this important event and to speak about such an important topic, um, school leadership, which I think will really shape some of the discussions about the quality of education um, for the, the years or maybe decades to come. But I would like to start with a couple of health warnings. Um, first of all, I am not a school leadership expert. My work is more in the field of governance, so the context, I think, in which school leadership plays out. But you should know. Second is that I haven't been part of this network so far. So if I'm going to reiterate some of the steps that you've already set, I apologize. But I hope that a fresh perspective or a different approach might also bring something to the network. And third, um, before I became a more or less respectable researcher in the Netherlands, I worked at the OECD, which kind of reading some of the material that you've used is not always a, a qualification. Um, some people are quite, and sometimes also um, understandably critical of the work of the OECD, where that's where I come from. So today I wanted to talk about three um, separate things. Um, first, I would like to take a step back and talk a little bit about the changing context of the school system, like the big kind of social and governance changes in which all of this plays out. Then I would like to kind of zoom in on the Dutch primary education system as one example of these changes and what it might mean. And then third, I want to kind of widen the discussion a little bit again and talk about some of the wider implications for school leadership. And I need to do all of that in 25 minutes, as I've been told by the chair, who will make threatening kind of gestures if I, if I go on for too long. <laughs> So let's start um, quickly with um, the context. And, and I think you know, there's obviously a lot of um, important ch change in the social kind of context in which we educate people. Um, rising globalization, global flows of goods, services, information, money, capital, people, ideas, are really reshaping kind of what it means to live in a nation state or what a nation state means itself. Disintegrating institutions, things like churches, unions, the welfare state, um, families, um, just don't, don't mean the same thing that they used to mean 50 years ago. They're all disintegrating to a certain uh, aspect. There is less natural authority. Doctors, teachers, um, ministers, politicians don't have the kind of natural authority that they might have had 50 years ago or even 30 years ago. They need to earn kind of respect and trust and authority over and over again. Um, weakening traditions, you know, less than ever before, what we are going to do in the future is now guided by what has happened in the past and saying, well, we've always done it like this is less than ever a real kind of argument. And increasing individuality, that's kind of a sum of all of this, is that this focus on the belief that what we do as an individual, our individual choices are really important. And it's really important to be free in that respect. So that's, I think, is all happening. And it's what, you know, kind of added up. This is what Sigmund Bauman refers to as liquid modernity. This kind of notion that things used to have a place and a structure and a position. And now that's all fluid and things are moving along. And, and the best way to illustrate this is maybe if you, if you think about um, a woman born in the early 20th century, if you'd know in which country she was born, in which kind of family, uh, what kind of family income, occupation of the father, the village or the city where she was born, you could more or less predict with a certain degree of certainty what her life would be like, like where she would live, what her family would be doing, you know, how large her family would be, what kind of work she would be doing, what kind of hobbies she would have. All of these things were kind of predictable. And now that's no longer the case. All of these things are open choices. Um, and that's great. And I think we, we all think that's really important and value that. But it also makes the job of governing this system very difficult. People are not so easy to pin down. There's a lot of choice, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of complexity. And so there's a real question whether the state is actually able to deal with this. And I think, you know, that's been an important debate in the last 30 years. So whether the state is, is in fact part of the, of the solution to kind of social problems or whether it's part of the problem. And of course, you know, this famous quote by Reagan, the most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. You know? That's when you really start, should start running, when the government comes along. Yeah. And of course, the idea that the government is part of the problem is this notion that you know, 
real kind of innovation, real solution to problems comes from the market or comes from individual people, not from some big state that tells you how to do things. And of course, this is also really the birth of new public management, you know, with some figureheads on the, on the right hand side. And I won't, I won't kind of bore you with reading out this entire list, but I think new public management is basically about two separate things. It's either kind of reducing the size of, the, of government, just downsizing, lowering taxes, um, things like that, retrenching the welfare state. Or where that's not possible or feasible, it's trying to make the government more like a market. So output steering, decentralization, performance measurement, commodification of public services, all of these things are really kind of trying to make the government more market-like. So, obviously, new public management has been kind of rightly criticized often. So, performance measurement, for example, has very clear perverse effects. And it's teaching to the test, in a sense. Um, decentralization has not always brought this kind of, you know, efficiency gains that we hoped for. Um, um, and, and other aspects of new public management, too, are just not always that successful or even cause problems. And there's also more of an understanding now, I think, than 30 years ago, that there are certain things, the public good, where we really want the state to be important and to make the decisions and not leave things to the market. But I think it's not just a technical solution to a technical problem. New public management is not just about effectiveness or efficiency. I think it's also trying to make sure that governments work in the context of this kind of liquid modernity and Sigmund Bauman, these trends that I was discussing in the beginning. So I think some form of new public management will stay with us. I think performance measurement, for example, is partly about making things more market-like, but it's also partly about, you know, schools and hospitals need to be accountable to us in a situation where we no longer trust them, you know, self-evidently. Before it was, you know, like 30 or 40 years ago, it might have been enough for a hospital just to have some men with white coats running around and basically to, to trust that the hospital would actually make you healthy. Now we don't trust hospitals you know, that easily anymore. And we don't trust schools similarly. We want to have some kind of performance measurement. And I think that that's understandable. And that's kind of adjusting to the situation. Decentralization as well, I think. You know, complexity of society is just too big for one central state or even for regional governments to kind of oversee it. We need to decentralize the schools, where schools in their smaller environment can really adjust to local contexts and local situations. So it's a really, uh, decentralization is also a way to handle kind of complexity, so it won't go away. I think the good old days of like central government, and trusting in that kind of government are over. So, entrance of the Dutch case. Um, <laughs> And I, I'm using the Dutch case, and I'm focusing particularly on primary education, because I think the Dutch case is an interesting example of you know, taking these ideas of new public management to quite an extreme level. Um, and so even though I don't think you know, other countries are not always comparable with the Netherlands, I think this might be a direction in which your systems are heading. And so I just wanted to discuss you know, the Netherlands as an example. Um, so first of all, you can see here, this is a um, a graph on the decentralization of the system, so left central state, central and state kind of de decisions that are made by the central and the state, the percentage of decisions pertaining to education, right, um, local and school kind of you know, decisions made about education. And you can see that in almost all countries, um, the number of decisions over time by um, local and school level has gone up. And this is from 1998 and 2007, which we have data for. But of course, a lot of decentralization happens from the 80s onwards, so aren't even captured by this, this graph. And, of, and you can also see that the Netherlands is, is quite a, a decentralized country compared to many other countries in the OECD, what we have data for. So just to kind of you know, sum up the governance situation of the Netherlands, it is a um, highly decentralized governance structure. We have a long tradition of school autonomy in the Netherlands, and it's basically a result of um, the struggle of religious groups to get the right to establish their own kind of privately run but publicly funded education and to get the freedom to teach in those kind of established schools what they wanted to do within certain uh, limits. And, and that kind of tradition of autonomy has in the past you know, 30 years only been moved further. 
So now the, the public schools are also very autonomous and they're guided by more or less the same kind of um, governance, um, governance regulation, governance framework. Um, and there are no formal intermediary levels. So <coughs> you have in the Netherlands the state level and there is the school level or the school board level, but in between there are no real formal levels. The local level, which is quite important in other countries, the UK or Sweden, doesn't really play a role. It's now in big cities, local level, the local level is trying to play a bigger role and sometimes succeeding, but it's doing so without a formal kind of basis for its power. And there are some organizations that are intermediary, but they, are not, they don't have a formal role in the system. They're not recognized by law. So that's quite an extreme choice. Um, and then the steering philosophy is quite extreme as well. So first of all, financing schools is basically a lump sum formula funding kind of situation, mostly based on the number of students and the justice for students that need more money. So migrant students or students with special needs get kind of higher, get more funding through the formula. And there's an extreme kind of focus on performance measurement. So both at the end of primary education and at the end of secondary education, there are tests. In primary education, it's a voluntary test, but I think almost 100% of the schools in the Netherlands now does some kind of um, test that is compare, makes it comparable to other schools. And all in the end of secondary education, in all instances, is a national exam. And, and, and there's a really strong focus on comparing schools and how they do at these tests. And just the other day, a ranking came out in one of the national newspapers showing basically the, the position, like the ranking of all these different schools adjusted for social background. There's some, some, quite some um, advanced stuff going on, but it's, but it's really this focus on output. Uh, and and the, what happens in education, and what happens in classrooms, teaching, learning, you know, between teachers and students, isn't, is pretty much a black box as far as government is concerned. And, um, and for a really long time, if you, um, it's changing a little bit now, but if you talk with the people at the ministry, and you'd ask them any question about the content of education, about pedagogy or curriculum, or about strategy, or about what schools should look like in 20 years time. They basically say, well, I'm sorry, you know, we're responsible for the system as a whole. We don't have an opinion on that, and we don't really know either. And it's really, you know, so that's, that's, that's pretty uh, extreme. But there are, it's not just lump sum funding and performance measurement, there are a lot of voluntary programs, very often financed by the ministry, but run by private or semi-public uh, organizations that are actually, you know, that schools can sign up for almost on a voluntary basis. Because the state feels or you know, that it is not entitled to directly mingle into education. So they use this kind of indirect approach. <coughs> So just to kind of give you a graph, and you know, I think this makes it more or less understandable. Sorry, I have 10 minutes. 22 minutes then. <laughs> okay. Um, the Dutch, if you imagine being the Dutch minister, I mean, you're facing basically 1,200, you know, 7,500 almost schools, 1,200 school boards, and 1,200 very diverse school boards. So on the one hand, there's quite a lot of schools that have only you know, school boards that only manage one school. And, and these can be quite small schools, you know, 40 people somewhere in the countryside in the north of the Netherlands. But 6% of the, of, the, of the school boards run 20 or more schools. I mean, these are really big kind of school organizations that run more than 20 schools that have professional management. And if you're a minister, you're basically talking to all these people at the same time because there is no real intermediary level. I mean, this is, this is quite you know, complex to deal with. So I think this focus on lump sum funding, on performance measurement is quite understandable in this context. But, but just to kind of, you know, what does that look like in practice? And I just wanted to use one example um, of how the Netherlands deals with very weak schools. Um, I'm basically in the, um, you know, in the early tw 21st century, <laughs> it sounds so grand if you say it like that, um, the, um, the, the Dutch inspectors started to make lists of really very weak schools uh, based on a couple of indicators. And it was for internal use to basically see like, where should we divert most of our resources to, you know, because we don't want our kids to be in very weak schools. And through the Freedom of Information Act, the media got a hold of these lists of very weak schools. They wanted to publish them. And that changed kind of the dynamics. So now we have a system where um, 
lists of very big schools are actually produced. But there's quite a sophisticated system. So what the inspectorate does is, first of all, it makes a risk assessment, just based on a couple of quantitative indicators. They sort the schools out and either at risk or not at risk. If you're not at risk, the inspectorate kind of stays pretty far away from you. If you are at risk, then you go to the next step. So schools are divide, divided up into very big schools, weak schools, normal schools. Normal schools, they can kind of take care of themselves, more or less. The very big schools, on the other hand, I mean, they get very, very intense kind of scrutiny by the inspector. The inspector really moves up close and personal to these schools and starts to work with the schools to improve the quality of education. And, and on top of that, <coughs> there are special improvement programs run by kind of private bodies. Um, for example, the, the, the Council for Primary Education runs a couple of these programs, twinning programs, coupling a, a strong school and a weak school to each other. But really kind of programs not so much to punish the school, but to really help it improve. So that happens. And at the same time, all parents in a very big school get a letter from the inspectorate, from the ministry, um, saying, your kid is going to a very weak school. We're just telling you. <laughs> and of course, you know, this, these kind of messages give a huge shock to the system. I mean, it turns out that actually not that many parents take the kid away from a very weak school, but it, it does, of course, kind of create a lot of havoc in these, uh, in these schools. And if a school does not improve within one year, it used to be two years, now it's one year, it will be closed down. Or at least the minister has a right to close it down. So it's a pretty harsh kind of program with you know, a lot of sticks, very few carrots, and some programs to kind of help schools actually to become better. Um, and I think, you know, that, but that's a good illustration of what the world looks like in a system such as the Netherlands. So. And I think it has different kind of implications for governance. So first of all, you know, where's the ministry in all of this? It's, uh, it's mostly inspectorate that seems to be in the driving seat. And the ministry has you know, very little kind of authority, very little ideas, and it's, it's really difficult you know, what the ministry should actually do. On the other hand, there's a strong position for the inspectorate. And there's a question, well, is that such a good idea? You know, if the inspectorate decides that it will start to focus its inspections on certain topics, the whole system actually steers towards those topics. And they are more in the driving seat than the ministry. But the inspectorate should be an impartial kind of <coughs> judge of quality, not the kind of guys in the driving seat or the girls in the driving seat. So there's a real issue there. Second you know, group of, of issues is that it's very difficult in the Netherlands to arrive at a compelling strategy. How do you, you know, work with like, 1,200 school boards um, and lots of different kind of private public public and private organizations to arrive at some kind of strategy. Everybody has different goals. How do you arrive at a couple of, you know, how do you focus on a couple of very compelling goals that you want to focus your system on? There's a real issue because we focus on performance measurement and because that performance measurement is mostly to get away from, from failure, failing schools, we focus a lot on failure and on things that are not going so well. But we don't really focus so much on how we make normal schools into good schools or good schools into great schools. There's a real lack of kind of that discussion. It's starting a little bit now, but, but they're mostly excellent. And that's like for the small like 1% or something. But this, this general notion that, we, that the ministry is there to just improve the school system, to make it kind of, you know, yeah, from normal to good, from good to great, isn't really very strong. And there's a problem in the Netherlands, I think, with a very fragmented knowledge system, partly because the position of the ministry is so weak, all schools are working together with all kinds of different private, semi-public organizations to kind of develop stuff. Um, on the one hand, that's great because it brings kind of development and research and very close to schools. On the other hand, there's a real problem in the Netherlands with making mass and focus <coughs> to in educational research, which don't have that. And there's also a real issue with, you know, kind of reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. And I think finally, it makes a system very reliant on uh, high quality school teachers, school, school leaders, uh, teachers as well actually. But I think in the Netherlands and in such decentralized systems um, where government almost abstains from content, a lot of the things that in some other countries are happening at the government level or the regional level or even the local level has to be done by school leaders in these systems. Uh, and so that brings me to the last kind of part of my, my topic. Um, school leadership in this context. So, 
I think um, you know school leaders in, are in a rather <coughs> difficult um, position in these systems. Um, I think that you know this is how I'm going to try and explain it. I think they need to make three separate splits. So here's Jean Claude Van Damme, uh, muscles from Brussels, doing one split. You, know? like, you have to imagine that school leaders need to do three splits at the same time. You know? Jean Claude Van Damme doesn't even have enough legs to do that, uh, but school leaders need to do it every day. So I think the first split that school leaders kind of need to deal with is that on the one hand, we have very high expectations of school leaders and school, schools. We want schools to solve all kinds of social issues. Yeah. Um, we want schools to provide quality, ec uh, equality, equity. Uh, we want them to integrate minorities. We want to create, have healthier uh, populations and schools should fight obesity. We want schools to deal with uh, special need, ADHD, dyslexia. And all of these things are understandable, huh? but very high expectations of what a school can do. On the other hand, like if you look at a system like the Netherlands, that's almost kind of congealed distrust. You know? it's, the whole system is based on the, on the notion, not always explicitly so, that if you do not inspect schools, if you do not measure performance, if you do not judge schools, if you don't make this stuff public, then um, education, then schools just won't provide it. And so it's, that's a very strange kind of way of dealing with the system. On the one hand, you load all these kind of expectations on people. On the other hand, you kind of you know, you create this low trust system around them. So as I said, you know, we expect schools to solve all these social problems and to do lots of things at the same time. But because we have a performance measurement system focusing on, uh, on, on reading, on mathematics, on natural sciences, you know, the PISA kind of trinity. Um, and these are very important topics. I mean, I don't I think schools should be judged by this and it should be held accountable. But that's not all of what makes you know, high quality education. There's more to this and, and, and more difficult to measure things like, I don't know, whether you're a well-rounded person, whether you can work together with other people, whether you are creative, that are kind of left out of this system. So, but we expect schools to do all of that, but yet we only judge them by a couple of things. And I think importantly, and this is a beautiful book written by uh, Schwartz and Sharp, is we write basically about what do we need to kind of be successful or be, you know, do well in these complex societies that we are in. And they, they talk about practical wisdom, which they basically take from Aristotle. And it's basically about the ability to assess complex situations, to make choices when there is no clearly bad and clearly good choice, never, and to kind of follow through on these, on these, on these, um, on these choices. And, and one of the things they describe is that experts or people who do the work are usually quite good at that in a very intuitive way. But if you int introduce an abundance of incentives and rules, that job actually becomes more difficult because then people start to focus on, oh, what's the rule? What's the protocol? What's the thing? Instead of thinking for themselves. Or when you inf introduce incentives, other things than, let's say, the core of education, but things like, you know, what's my salary? Or how's the school going to look like in the, in the papers are going to be more important. So practical wisdom, they argue, is destroyed to a certain extent by this system in which we have an abundance of incentives and rules. And I think, you know, so it's, those are three very difficult splits that we've created ourselves. And I think, you know, that's what I mostly wanted to argue is we need to rebalance this system. We need to kind of, there will be a need for like, for performance measurement um, and for some of these systems we put into place. Decentralization will not go away. But we need to somehow balance it in a way that performance measurement is not just the end kind of, of the discussion, that performance measurement is the beginning of the discussion. And I think ministers and people in power should say so, that yes, it's important to measure performance, but yes, it's only a very small part of what schools are about. And that's the kind of wider discussion that we should be having in our societies. So that's a difficult challenge. And I hope that the coming two days will actually contribute to that. Thank you very much. <laughs>